Hi everyone, we're so glad you're joining us online today for our church online live service on Facebook. My name is Pastor Mike, lead pastor at Impact Church, and I just want to thank you guys for allowing us into your home, and uh, I'm excited. I'm so encouraged by what God's been doing in our church and getting us ready for our September 20th grand reopening. Lots of work, lots of volunteers that have been a part of what it is that we're uh, trying to accomplish here, that God is moving through. And uh, we want to thank each and every one of you for being a part of that. Thank you for those that have been giving to this ministry and uh, for seeing God move in such a big way already. And we haven't even technically opened yet. So it's been encouraging. It's been awesome. And I hope you guys are encouraged this morning as we open up God, God's Word together. Don't forget to comment below. Let us know where you're watching from. If you're watching from another state or your living room, awesome. Let us know who's in your kitchen or your living room with you joining us online. We'll talk to you guys again in a little bit. Sit back, grab your popcorn, and let's open up God's Word together. Good morning. Welcome to Impact Church. My name is Pastor Mike, lead pastor uh, here in Parksburg, Pennsylvania. I want to welcome you all to our morning gathering online. And uh, just say thank you for allowing us into your home. As we continue to just look into God's Word, see what it is that He wants to do in each and every one of our lives. So I'm very excited to be able to uh, be with you this morning. I hope that you are excited as well. You know, honestly, I don't think there's a better thing you could do with your time than opening up your your, your Bible and, and in your home with your kids, with your family uh, on a Sunday morning and really digging in to see what God has in store for you. So thank you so much for joining us. And uh, I hope you enjoy this. I hope you're encouraged by this as we, uh, as we dig into God's Word. So I want to get right into it and talk to you guys this morning about what it is that we've been going through with this series in Nehemiah. Now, a little bit of understanding of what's happening here in Nehemiah, the background, so you get a better understanding of why we're talking about this, how this relates to, to us today. You know, Nehemiah was a guy that basically has been facing a lot of adversity in his life. See, back in 539 BC, the Israelite nation, and Nehemiah was an Israelite, now he wasn't alive in 539, but this gives you a little history. In 539 BC, the Israelite nation had effectively turned their backs on God. And God had removed his hand of provision and protection from them. And when he did that, that allowed some of the, the other uh, neighboring countries that were in uh, the Middle East during that time, they actually came over in the, uh, the, the country, specifically Babylon, they came over and conquered the Israelite nation. And they took the Israelite people out of their homeland from Israel, from Jerusalem, and they removed them and took them into slavery, into bondage, for 70 years in, uh, in, the, in the city of Babylon. And while they were there, that's when God started to work on their hearts, and they understood what they had done, how they had turned their backs on God, and they repented. And then uh, after that 70 years of the captivity, the Persians came over, and God used the Persian Empire to come in free, defeat the Babylonians, and free the Israelites. And that's where Nehemiah comes in. Now the Israelites had been freed, and now they were heading back to Israel, back to Jerusalem, and also back to Persia. And Nehemiah eventually grew up to be the king's cupbearer in Persia. And what happened was, this was an example of God setting Nehemiah up for success for something that was coming down the road. See, the Israelites, as they slowly moved back to Jerusalem, were rebuilding their broken city. The temple had been burned, the walls had been destroyed, uh, their beautiful hometown was no longer a beautiful hometown. So, Nehemiah and the other Israelites were hurt by this, and they came to Nehemiah, and they actually talked to Nehemiah about how uh, they were feeling about you know, their home and the destruction and and how they weren't really a nation again, and they weren't uh, together. And basically, society was, was not what it should be uh, for, the, for the people that were living in Jerusalem. So Nehemiah, he was hurting by this. He was hurting because his people hurt. And King Artaxerxes, who was the cupbearer, or who was the king that Nehemiah was the cupbearer for, actually gave Nehemiah the resources to go back to Jerusalem to repair the broken wall, to repair the broken city, to fix what had been torn down. And we've been following this premise through the whole book of Nehemiah so far. 
that something that's broken, God wants to rebuild. We've talked about how Nehemiah um, had to learn to be patient, how he went through struggles, how he went through persecution. Uh, we learned how Nehemiah was hurting where he was, and God was setting him up to do great things later on. And Nehemiah's journey was like a roller coaster. You know, we go from him being hurt that his uh, that his people were hurting, that his hometown was hurt, and to all of a sudden now a high where King Artaxerxes said, "Go and fix your hometown. Go and fix Jerusalem. Rebuild what is broken. I'm going to give you the resources to do that." So now he's up here, and then all of a sudden he gets there, and the people are discouraged, and they start. He rallies them. The people rally, and they start. You know, getting fired up and ready to rebuild this wall. And they're encouraged again. And then all of a sudden people start attacking them. And now they're discouraged. And it's like this roller coaster ride, up and down, up and down. And we see that Nehemiah has gotten to this point where, you know, they're rebuilding the wall. The people are together. They're working. We've talked about the different struggles that they've had, you know, as the progress kind of goes up and down. Well, we're at this point right now where now Nehemiah has basically finished if not gotten the wall to the point where you know it's mostly there and they're continuing to kind of rebuild it and he doesn't have to focus on that as much so rebuilding the wall that train has been pushed is kind of going on its own but now he's trying to rebuild the people and he's trying to get them back to the point where God wanted them to be originally so we see Nehemiah and specifically I want to start in verse 6 And Nehemiah in verse 6, we see how things are kind of going back downhill again. And in verse 6 it says, When I heard of the complaints. So there's the downhill. Things were going great. Things were going good. You know, rough start, but got back up. You know, things are moving. And then all of a sudden, people are starting to complain. We talked a little bit about that last week with Chris's message. You should go back and check that out. Awesome message. You can go and look at it on our website. But he goes, I hear the complaints, and this is what's his reaction. He goes, I was angry. I was angry because he heard the complaints. And he wasn't angry because people were complaining. He was angry at what they were complaining about. See, there was a situation happening in the culture, and Nehemiah was angry that this was happening amongst his people. In fact, he was. To the point where he would sit there and question, why, why are we even doing this to each other? And he was angry. And, and it was because it was, it was brother against brother. It was families against families. It was relationships and kin that were going against each other. Into slavery, into bondage. There was a, there was a general issue. A sin problem amongst all of them. And it was bringing them all down. And Nehemiah was angered by this because they weren't supposed to be a divided people. They were supposed to be a people that were together, that were moving as one, and they were divided. You know, I struggled here because, you know, a lot like Nehemiah, I find myself angry a lot right now at what's happening in our society. I, you know, I watch the news, you know, Facebook, I see speeches. I'm even listening, you know, to, to preachers, to messages. And as I'm listening to these uh, to these preachers and they're talking about you know these different podcasts and how does the church deal with racism in our in our country and and how do we do all these things and, and these riots and these you know these movements and all of the stuff that's happening and I just I get so wound up with what I'm seeing and I'm just angry you know and as a leader as a pastor I'm finding myself in a position where you know I've got to be careful with what I say, but I also need to make sure that I'm saying something. I have to be re- I have to be careful with my response because of the position that I find myself in. And I'll be honest with you guys, right now I didn't even want to talk about this. I didn't want to go down this road. I didn't want to deal with this subject right now because I get so wound up about it. But as I'm going through the word of God, and as, as the Holy Spirit is, is teaching me and leading me and showing me, I didn't have a choice. I didn't have a choice. And, and the reality is that the way that, that we react to this, you know, what's happening around us, the way that we react to the Holy Spirit pulling at us, 
to the way that we react what God has in store for us, you know, those reactions, those decisions are going to help dictate where we go next and what we do and how we look, not only as an individual, but as a society, as a people that's moving. You know, there's so many things that are happening right now that can make people angry. You know, we look at what's happening and we look at the reactions that people are having in our society and we have to make a choice as to how we're going to face this problem. Um, you know, as a pastor, for me, again, I, I have to be careful with what I say. I mean, I've been brought to the stables before for saying something uh, and somebody being offended that it wasn't even about them. You know, and the reality is, okay, now I need to watch what I say. But then as, I mean, honestly, as a, as a white evangelical pastor, if I don't say something right now, then people are going to get upset as well. So how do I balance this? How do I talk about this? How do we move forward? And listen, if you're, if you're about ready to tune me out right now, to turn me off because, uh, because you don't like what it is I'm saying, I, I want to ask you to do something real quick. I want to ask you to just stop and just listen and just calm your heart and open your mind. You know, and that's what I had to do. I had to get to this point because of the anger that I had. I had to stop and listen. I had to stop and think. I had to, to take what, what I was so upset about and I had to think about it for a minute. Look, and the reason why I did that is because I read verse 7. So he says, I'm very angry. You know what he says? He goes, after thinking it over. After thinking it over. And Chris, he talked about this last week. It was awesome. And there's a lot of truth to this. I need to stop and think. You know, I need to make sure that I understand that it's not just about my ideas. It's not just about what I'm trying to accomplish or what I think is best. We need to make sure that as we're moving forward, we're moving forward together. And that's like-mindedness as well. You know, and, and that's what Nehemiah does. Nehemiah says he thinks it over. He calms down. He analyzes what it is that's happening. And then he does something about it. He goes, he goes in verse 7, he goes, then he calls out the officials and the nobles. He calls out the officials and the, no, and the nobles. And these guys are the ones that are in the middle of the problem. All right? They're the ones that are, that are right in the middle of what all of is happening here. And he calls them out and he says, listen, we have a problem that we need to deal with. We have a problem that we need to deal with. So as we look at this, as we take this time right now, to sit back and to think, I don't want you to sit there and, 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 and just, you know, as much as we like to blame the media and the politicians and the radicals and the left and the right and, you know, Trump or Obama or the lack of justice or the lack of mercy and grace that we are showing to other people, we can blame a lot of things. But the reality is that we need to stop and think about ourselves for a minute too. We need to stop putting this on everybody else and start looking at ourselves first. You know, it's just like with my kids. I mean, I can't even tell you how many times, even just today. You know, I'll look at one of them and say, who, why did you do this? And the instant, like it was like nature, second nature to them. Well, Mason did this. Or Joshua did that. You know, I'll, I'll sit there and say, well, why did you do this? Well, because they did that. Or they, did. you know, we like to put it on everybody else. And we're not thinking about ourselves. And I wonder that if we would to sit back and just start self-evaluating as opposed to evaluating everybody else, maybe we would make a little bit more progress. And I want to talk to you guys about what that self-evaluation looks like. Because it's not going to be a fun one. You know, it's not something that you're going you're gonna to come out of and you're going to uh, be happy about. But I want us to just open up our hearts and our minds. I want us to let down you know, our, our presumptions and our prejudice. And I want you to allow the Holy Spirit to work in your heart right now, in your mind right now. You know, you might sit there and say, you know, well, well Pastor Mike, I'm not prejudiced. Well, maybe. But I think in a moment we're going to kind of see that that's not necessarily true. You know, we have a lot of things that that we allow to uh, focus in our hearts that we don't even necessarily know. We don't even realize that those things are there. 
And I want us to stop and think it over. Look at our own hearts. Like, I had to do that. I had to sit back and examine why I was so angry. And, and why, you know, people in this society right now are being treated the way that they are. And I'm not talking just blacks. I'm talking black and white and every other skin tone. I'm talking about the police, emergency workers, government officials, public figures, pastors, families. We're all in this situation together. And we all need to think about how we're reacting to it. And the reality is I had to put aside my perfect opinion today. I had to put that aside. Because I need to think about what it was that I thought. I needed to break that down and understand what it is that we're doing. You know, I want you to understand that before I go any farther, that I absolutely, all right, I absolutely believe that there is racism in this world. Absolutely believe it. I absolutely believe that there is privilege in our country. And I'm not talking about white privilege, but I am talking about how people are treated differently according to the way they look, according to the way they dress, according to the way they talk, how much money they have. And you don't have to be white to have any of those things, but there's absolutely a privilege issue in our country. I absolutely believe that the majority of our police are great people. I believe absolutely that we have people that have genuine, justified fear in their hearts right now. I absolutely believe that. I believe that there are protesters who are out there on the streets for the right reason. And I also believe that there are people that are taking advantage of a painful platform just to get their egos satisfied. But you know what I believe more? Is that the root of all of this, all this pain and this mistrust and this anger and this rebellion and the division that we're seeing right now is the cause of one specific thing. And that's sin. And that is the orchestrator of the sin, which is Satan. And he is loving what it is that's happening in our society right now. He is loving that, that brother is against brother. That kin is against kin. That people are against people. That families are being broken up. And I understand that it's hard. And I understand that it's easier to put the blame on somebody else. But the reality is that we all have this issue called sin. We all have it. We're all broken people. Every one of us. You know, each generation from the fall of Adam to the millennials, the Gen X's and Y's and Z's, you know, no matter your race, your language, no matter your intellect or your financial status, no matter your family structure, uh, we're broken. I'm broken. I'm absolutely broken. We don't trust each other. We don't care for each other. We are surrounded by darkness. And friends, I think we've become part of that darkness. We have gotten to the point where the light that we should be shining, that we should be showing the world around us, is almost gone, if not completely snuffed out. We are not what Jesus has called us to be. And I'm angry about it. I'm angry about it. And you know, when you look at Nehemiah, you understand why he's angry. Look at the second part of verse 7. As he pulls the officials and the nobles together, and this is what he says. He goes, I told them, you are hurting your own relatives. You are hurting 
your own people, your own neighbors, your own family. Everything that we are doing right now in our society is dividing us. And instead of us trying to come together and, and resolve these problems, we're just attacking each other constantly. And there's this division. We are literally hurting our own people. And Nehemiah goes on, he goes, he goes, I want to call a public meeting to deal with the problem. So, friends, that's what I'm doing right now. I'm calling a general meeting for all of us. And I'm asking all of us to lay down our pride, our prejudice, our naive stances, our cynical assertiveness, and just listen. Just listen to what it is that God wants to say to us. And you might sit there and say, you know what, Pastor Mike, I'm not prejudiced. I'm not prideful. I'm not naive. You know, I don't know, maybe you're not. But just yesterday, as I'm you know, going over this message again, uh, we had someone come by our home. We had a well issue at our new, at our new home. And we had someone come and and he was here for about an hour. Gentleman, uh, he was great, he was kind, he was courteous, very friendly. I walked around the property with him for an hour trying to figure out what was going on. Just a real good guy. And even though I met him for an hour, honestly, I trusted him afterwards. And I, and I just felt like this guy, you know, he cared about what the problem was and he wanted to help us. So I had this impression of this, of this individual. And I go upstairs and, you know, and the news wasn't good. And even with the news not being good, he was still someone that I said, I appreciate you. I appreciate what you did for me. And I go upstairs later on and I'm talking to my wife. And I say, you know, I'm giving her the bad news about what it is, you know, that we're going to have to put some money out to fix this problem. And her reaction was, are you sure they're just not trying to make more money? And look, if any of you know my wife, she's literally the kindest, most gracious, most merciful and loving person I know. She she strives. She literally looks for the best in everybody. And, and her gift is to make other people feel loved. Like, that's who she is. And her reaction showed exactly what each and every one of us have built inside of us. We are prejudiced. And we sat, we sat there last night. We talked about it. How this prejudice is just built into us because of... Of, our, of the pain, of the life that we've lived, of the society that we're growing up in. You know, we are prejudiced. We were prejudiced last night, and we didn't even realize it. And we talked about this, and we, we said, where is this coming from? We were trying to break it down, and the reality is we're broken people. And, you know, we, we see things from our hurt instead of from God's heart. We see things from our hurt instead of from God's heart. Because I'm hurting, you have to hurt. Because I'm hurting, you obviously can't be trusted either. Because I'm hurting, everything around me is worse. And that's just what's inside of us. We, we blame everything else but the actual author of chaos. It's like he's the one that's getting away with all of this. And none of us are blaming him. None of us are looking to the sin problem. We're all looking at each other instead. And instead of breaking this cycle of hate and violence and prejudice and judgment, all we do is just respond with more hate and more violence and more prejudice and more judgment. And we're not taking away the actual problem. And we're continuing to fight each other. We're jaded people. We are absolutely jaded people because what's been done to us, now we're doing to somebody else. You know, Aerosmith, he had it right when he wrote that song. And he said that the girl was jaded. And you remember what he said? Why she was jaded? Do you know what he said? Why she was jaded? Because I'm the one that jaded you. Right? We, we, we have 
torn this cycle. We've made this thing happen over and over and over again. And we keep thinking that another argument or another fight or another debate or another accusation is going to fix these problems. And that my absolute perfect idea of how to solve the problem is the only one that's going to actually fix it. And we continue in our brokenness to live our lives and, and generation after generation, this sin issue just continues to grow. And that light that we're supposed to have just gets dimmer and dimmer and dimmer. We're blinded. We're blinded by our pride. And, and the hate. And, and instead of being... Instead of hating the problem, we're hating people. We're not supposed to be hating the people. And, and we're, we're lost in this right now. We're lost in this. And I think every single one of us, every single one of us, have to examine ourselves for this right now. I had to. I absolutely 100% had to. My name is Michael Bailey, pastor. Michael Bailey, and I am prejudiced, and I am judgmental, and I am sorry. I need you to forgive me as much as I need to forgive others so we can move forward and stop this. Nehemiah gives us the attitude adjustment, the, the avenue of success for us to be able to, to break this cycle that we are continuously battling with each other. And he goes on and, and he says he, he brings this meeting together. And he, he encourages, he goes, we're doing everything we can to redeem. And he goes, we're, we're stopping the problem. We're not... Now, these guys specifically had a problem with, you know, selling each other into slavery, basically. Being selfish and greedy with their money, and with their land. And they were constantly putting debt over each other's heads and hurting each other. And I know that's not the specific topic that our society is dealing with right now. But the, the reality is that it's people versus people, right? And that is the problem that we have right now. And Nehemiah, he says, this is how... We're going to get through this. This is how we're going to fix this. This is how we're going to get past this. And we're going to start healing and looking to future hope and give some redemption to the situation. And he says this, look, in verse 8, At the meeting I told them, We are doing all we can to redeem the Jewish rel relatives who have had to sell themselves to pagan foreigners. But you are selling them back into slavery again. How often must we redeem them? And listen, they had nothing to say. Do you want to know why they had nothing to say right there? Do you want to know why they didn't argue back and start justifying their stupid choices and their bad decisions? Because they listened. They closed their mouths and they listened. And they examined themselves. And because they said nothing, then they heard what was said next. And he says in verse 9, Then I pressed further. What are you do what you are doing is not right. What you are doing is not right. Should you not walk in fear of God in order to avoid being mocked by the enemy? He goes, I myself, as well as my brothers and the workers, have been lending people money and grain. But let's listen, circle this. Let's just stop. This business of charging each other interest. Did you catch what he said? Let's just stop. Let's stop spreading hate. Let's stop spewing words. Let's stop dividing with dissension and, 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 and disruption in our society. And stop using these platforms that are actually for good to start getting out there your selfish ambitions and, and whatever evil feelings that you have that you want to beat out on somebody else. 
We need to stop. And we need to get back to what it is that we're supposed to be doing. Christians, listen, don't, you got to be better than these trolls that are roaming over social media and picking fights. These people that are in our society that are wearing, uh, that are hiding behind their screens and their masks. And listen, I'm not talking about the COVID masks. And you know I'm not talking about the COVID masks. And if you just got mad at me about talking about COVID masks, then you're part of the problem. I'm talking about the people that are hiding behind something that's covering up their entire face, their eyes. You want to know why? Because they don't want the people that they're persecuting to look them in the eyes. We are, we have to get to this point where our actions and words aren't pulling people down, but they are lifting people up. And they are breaking a cycle, not continuing it. We are supposed to, as Christians, show love, not show hate. We are continuously, continuously fighting each other. And I'm not talking about whites versus blacks right now. I'm talking about people. People. I'm talking about relatives and kin and brothers and sisters, north, south, east, west. I don't care where you're from. I'm talking about people. You know, we are not one nation under God right now. And the reality is we're not called to be one nation under God. We are called to be one people under God. And we're missing that. We've lost that. Somewhere along the lines, we went from, from loving one another and, and asserting one another and helping one another and being there for one another to beating one another to branding one another, belittling each other. And that's not what God has called us to do. Look at verse 12. I'm sorry, verse 11. He says, we must stop. And then verse 11, he says, you must restore. Now, Nehemiah says specifically the fields and the vineyards and the groves and the homes, the people. He even says, repay that interest. And then in verse 12, he goes, they replied, we will give back everything. And he says to them, will you do what you say? And they said, yes. We will do what you say. We will do what Scripture says. I'm not asking you to do what I say. I'm not getting this from me. I didn't want to talk about this. I'm getting this from here. From God's Word. And He says, Stop. Love each other. Stop hating each other. Stop beating each other. Stop belittling each other. And do what it is that I say. We need to love those people around us. And we need to look at them and understand that, you know what? It's not about how they look or how they talk or what they wear or what their job is or their family status or their financial situation. We are to love them because they are people. We need to look at them not by their sin. We need to look at them by how God looked at them. And you know how God looked at them? He put a son on a cross for them. He put a son on a cross for me. And that's the attitude. That's how the telescope that we're supposed to be viewing the people that are around us in our society and in our lives. When you look past what the sin is that's made them who they are, and we can see them as God saw them. That He wanted to save them. Then your perspective changes. I told you earlier that I am absolutely guilty of being prejudiced. But I have never looked at someone that had a different skin tone than me and thought less of them. I haven't. But I've absolutely looked at people that 
dressed a certain way, or talked a certain way, or lived in a certain place, or had a certain job. I am absolutely guilty of that. And I think if we are honest with ourselves, we need to start treating people the way that Jesus treated people. For me, it shouldn't be about treating them the way the world treats them. I need to treat everyone the same way that Jesus treated the woman at the well. Or the, the lady that was bleeding in the crowd. Or the leper. Or how Jesus treated the sinners when he sat and ate with them. Or how Jesus treated the people that put him on a cross. When he looked up and he said, God, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he hung there. And if I look at people like that, the way that Jesus looks at people, the way that God looks at people, then I think we can do better. I think we can be what God wants us to be. We can be more. And Christians, that's what we need to be. We need to be more. We need to be not greater, not better, that we put ourselves higher than those around us. Just more. More like Jesus. More like what God wants for us. How He designed us for relationships, for love. To support each other and to, to show each other kindness. You know, Jesus is the ultimate example of hate being resisted and love being shown. You know, when He forgave those people that were literally crucifying Him in that moment, He showed us how we should treat those around us. You know, we've all betrayed our Creator. We've all betrayed God with our choices, with our actions. We've all fallen short of the glory of God. And because we fall short, we need to make sure that, that we're doing everything that we can to show those around us who He is. Because He is the only answer to this problem. It is through love, it is by grace that Jesus Christ was on a cross for us. And the love that, that he showed on that cross, on that tree at Calvary, it gives us a new purpose. It gives us a new direction. It gives us something to, to really fight for. Something that we should really be going after. Instead of hating each other all the time. And that cross, it gives us hope. In a hopeless world, it gives us light where there's so much darkness. Jesus loves you. And because He loves you, He paid a cost upon a cross. Because we couldn't pay for that sin problem. We couldn't pay that price of our betrayal, of the sin in our lives. There's no amount of things you can do. There's no amount of money you can pay. And that's why Jesus paid that price for us upon a cross. So when Jesus came and He lived a perfect life, and he died and defeated death and rose from the grave, that right there is love. Everything he did, he did for me. Even though I was the reason he was on the cross. He didn't turn around and hate me, or spew words at me, or, or hurt me. You know what he did? He died for me. He died for you. And now that love that he had for us, that saved a world, that saved the history of mankind, the same love we need to be showing to those around us every day. And I want us all to call on the name of Jesus. For those of you that have never accepted Him as Savior, call on the name of Jesus. 
For those of you that are examining your heart right now and you find yourself short, you find yourself, you know what, I am prejudiced. I am in a situation where I'm not loving people the way that I should. Call on the name of Jesus. Ask for forgiveness. Move forward. Pray with me. God, just thank you so much. Thank you for this day. Thank you for this opportunity. Lord, and amongst the struggles and the pains and, and everything that's happening in our lives right now, Lord, we just trust you. God, we look to you. We ask you, God, to, to give us peace, to give us comfort, to give us hope, to help us, Lord, to know what to do next. God, if there's anyone sitting here right now that has never accepted your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, Lord, I pray that they would open up their hearts to you right now. God, that they would call out the name of Jesus. They would thank you, God for the gift of dying on the cross. For, uh, friend, if you're sitting there right now and you want to accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, I want to just ask you to just say this prayer. you got to mean it. you got to make a decision right now that you want Jesus to be the leader of your life. And you say, Jesus, I'm sorry. I'm sorry I'm a sinner. I'm sorry that, that, that I've, I've done these things against you and against God. I want to ask you to come into my heart, to become the leader of my life, to save me today. So that this day forward, I will follow you with everything I do. Thank you for living a perfect life, for dying on the cross, and for defeating death and rising from the grave. Come into my heart. Lead me today. Christian, repent right now. Ask God to show you the areas of your heart where you need to get back on course with Him. Lord, we thank you so much for this day. We thank you for the opportunity to open your word. God, we ask that you would bless us. You would protect us. You would lead us. God, we ask for healing for our country, God. God, move in a big way and move through us. We love you, we praise you, we thank you. And we ask these things in your name. Amen. Friend, I want to thank you for being here. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you, talk with you. And I want to just, again, plead with you. Just think. Just stop and think. Give yourself an honest opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work in your heart and your mind so that He can not only fix you, but maybe He can start fixing the world around us. Thank you guys again. My name is Mike. Check us out on our website, impactpa.church. Thank you guys again so much for inviting us into your home. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your afternoon, and I hope to see you again soon. Thanks, friends, for taking the time this morning to join with us as we opened God's Word and really talked about a heavy subject. It took listening ears this morning, and I'm grateful that you opened up your ears and stayed the whole time to listen. You know, this is a hard subject to breach. It's a hard subject to talk about, but we still have to talk about it. You know, we have to get to that point where we're willing to talk about the hard things so that God can change the hard things inside of us. So thank you guys so much for, for doing that, for being willing to open up your hearts and your minds. And if you had a, a moment where God was really speaking to you and you were encouraged, let us know about it. We'd love for you to reach out to the church and just, uh, if you need questions, if you have questions or you want some uh, somebody to talk to or anything like that, prayer, please let us know. This isn't just a ministry uh, where you're just watching us online. We want to be involved in your lives. We want to help you guys. We want to lead you guys. We want to disciple you. So make sure that you take that opportunity to reach out to us so that we can be a part of what it is that God's doing in your life. Thanks for joining us this week. We hope to see you back again next week.